get off this chair, please? Ruby. Thank you, Ruby. Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series in which I cover an older board game gem. This episode is about a game called Verflixt, which first came out in 2005. In English, it is more well known as That's Life. Now, this came out 2005 from Ravensburger, designed by Mikhail Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer. It is for two to six players, ages eight and up, and takes about 30 minutes to play. That's all pretty fair. In terms of the player count, uh, you probably want the middle of the range, so four players is best. So there's almost no doubt about it. Three is fine, five is fine, but Honestly, three is good, four is better, five is worse, six is better than five, but worse than four. Uh, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. This came out around 2005, and it's had new life in the last few years, because in 2008, a sort of a... It's not exactly the same game, but it's a very, very similar game from the same designers. And it was called Ghosts of the Moor. It was published by Tasty Minstrel, RIP. It's not exactly the same game, but it bears a lot of the same DNA. And that was about 2018. And this only goes up to five players, not six. And then in 2020, Amigo republished the original Verflixed. And that's this edition here. And this is the one that I'm going to use uh, to show you how to play. After I show you how to play, I will explain why Verflix is still a gem today. To set up the game, you're going to take the tiles and lay them out in a path, a snake-like fashion, with the start tile on one end and the checkered flag, the finish tile, on the other end. This, what I've done here, is sort of a standard setup. This was the original setup as appeared in the original Verflixed, and is now considered the Pro version in the Amigo edition. The basic game mixes all these tiles up and also includes these tiles, which I won't get into. But you can add these to the game. You can mix up the tiles any way you like. You'll probably want to add these, the guards, these uh, eight pawns. And in this setup, which goes negative one to negative eight, and then the six lucky tiles, then the positive tiles eight to one, and then negative tiles negative one to negative ten. In general, you do this with a random setup as well. In general, you want to put the guards on the first eight good tiles. The good tiles being the green ones and the lucky ones, the clovers slash lilies. So in this setup, we're going to have guards on these first eight tiles, like so. Each player gets pawns, two pawns in a five or six player game, three pawns if you're playing with four or fewer. I'll set it up for a four player game. The goal of the game is to have the most points at the end. The game will end when all pawns have reached the finish line. Players are going to be collecting these tiles and they're going to add up their scores. These reddish tiles are negatives. These green tiles are worth positive points, and these are the lucky tiles. Every lucky tile that you've collected allows you to turn a negative tile into a positive. Play is clockwise. On your turn, you roll the die, and you move one of your three pawns that many spaces forward. If there are gaps in the path, then you simply skip them over. Nothing happens right away. Let me fast forward a bit. Now it's Green's turn again. They roll, and they can move any of their pawns. They can move one of these pawns or this one. Whenever you move a pawn that's on a tile, and it's the only thing that was on that tile, the player has to collect that tile. So if Green were to move this pawn, Green would go here, one, two, three, four, five, but then Green would have to take this tile. That's worth negative five points. And after that, there would be a gap, which later on the players would skip over. 
one, two, three, four, five. Now you see the guards. The guards are pawns that share tiles with the players. On a player's turn, if they move a pawn off of a tile, but there's still a guard on there, they don't collect the tile. They only collect the tile if their pawn is alone on the tile when they move it off. So guards prevent you from taking tiles. That's bad if you want to collect a positive tile, but it's good if you don't want to collect a negative tile. On your turn, instead of moving one of your pawns, with your roll you can instead move one of the guards, but only if the guard shares a tile with a pawn. So on yellow's turn, yellow could move one of these two pawns three spaces, or this pawn three spaces, and then they take the negative two, or they could move one of these guards because the guards share a tile with another player. You wouldn't be able to move these guards, but you could move these ones. And what you'll see over the course of the game is that the guards will gradually be moved off the lucky tiles so players can collect them, but then they're on the positive tiles, the green tiles. Then players will be moving the guards off the positive tiles onto the negative so that they can collect these, and then with the guards on the negative tiles, players try to use the guards kind of walk in their shadow to avoid having to take these tiles. Of course, if you have a couple of lucky tiles, you may want to get the worst of the tiles because they'll be worth actually a lot of positive points. Once all pawns have moved past a certain point, then any tiles that were skipped over and not taken, you can just take out of the game. You don't need to end by exact count on the finish line, just you just end if you have extra movements when you reach there, you just stop there. And when all pawns have reached the finish line, total up all your tiles. These are worth negative, but every lucky tile that you collect allows you to turn one negative into a positive. Total up all your points, and the player with the most points wins. That's it. You're ready to play Fair Flixed. Fair Flixed is a roll and move game. So it's a little bit of a throwback to those old style of games, but this came out in 2005. It's not that old. But roll and move is a mechanism that everybody understands way back from the days of Monopoly and I think even earlier. So, you know, it's a very common mechanism that everyone can understand. And this, and I've been doing this a lot lately, I think, <laughs> this is a three generation game, just like Picomino was. And then I think I did Las Vegas, right? The, all dice games and all three generation games. Uh, this is probably the simplest of all of them. And it really is a game that kids can enjoy, grandparents can enjoy. It doesn't take very long. Very, very simple. It is, in the end, a roll and move. And you only have basically one decision every turn. So you roll the die and you're choosing which pawn to move. I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you this is some super thinky game or anything. No, it isn't. Um, it is very simple to learn and it's very easy to play. And that one decision you make every round means, for one thing, there's not really any analysis paralysis, right? There's not really much to analyze, but there's still a bit of interaction. There's a nice little game of chicken. When your pawn and another player's pawn is on the same tile, and it's a good tile, and <laughs> you both want it, but both of you are hoping the other person will leave the tile first, so then when they leave, they'll get the tile. And so it's a little bit of a game of chicken, right? How long do you wait? Look, it's not a big deal, but it can be fun. Um, there are two versions of the game. So Verflixed has the new, I forgot what they call it, maybe the normal mode. Then they have the pro mode, but the pro mode is identical to the old That's Life. Now the original pro mode, as they call it now, has guards. And that does add a little bit of, a little bit more in the decision making realm because you're not just choosing one of your pawns to move, you can also move one of the guards. Um, 
the newest version's normal mode doesn't even use guards. And instead they have a couple of tiles which are double-sided and you don't actually take them, but when you leave the tile, you activate their special power. On one side is the gift side. And when you move off of that tile, you have to give your topmost tile in your scoring pile to another player. And if it's a bad tile, you give it to the player who has the best tile on top of their pile. And if it's a good tile, you give it to the player who has the worst tile on top. And then it flips over to its opposite side, and then it becomes steel. And then if you leave that tile when it's on steel mode, you get to take a tile from another player. It's a little thing, but that also creates a little bit more kind of in that fun family type of interaction, right? The type that kids work really well with. It's always fun to steal a tile from an adult, right? Or give a bad tile to an adult. All the regular tiles, like the tiles that are only in That's Life and everything except the Gift and Steel tiles in the, uh, in the new one, are just tiles that you collect. And it doesn't matter when you leave the tile, if you're alone, when you leave it, you get the tile. But the Gift Steel tiles add more of a timing element to it because maybe you could leave a steel tile. So that's good. You can steal a tile from another player, but turns out all the tiles on everybody's piles are bad. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to move that pawn, right? I'm going to move something else. I'm going to stall. I'm going to wait. And of course, the longer you wait, whether you're playing that game of chicken with another player or not, um, the longer you wait, the fewer options you have. Because later on, as your pawns start to cross the finish line, you have fewer options. It's not any sort of brain burner at all, but it's a quick, easy game. And it can play up to six people out of the box. These versions, not this Ghosts of the Moor, which I'll talk to I'll talk about in a little bit. But this one's five player max. These two are six player max, two to six. And I mean, I personally wouldn't play it with two players. Three is okay. Four is best. Now, two to four, each player has three pawns. And that gives you more choice when it's your turn. When you add more players, five or six, you drop a pawn. So you only have two pawns to move. As long as the guards are in play as well, that's not too, too bad, because you still have options. Instead of moving one of your two pawns, you may be able to move a guard. But yeah, you by having fewer pawns, you have fewer options. And that's why I say four player is the best, because you have the most options. And as soon as you go up to five, then you drop pawns and then you have fewer options and then at that point if you're just going to have two pawns anyway you might as well just have as many players as possible so six is actually better than five in that case so it's kind of a weird thing <laughs> for a game that can play well with kids and probably some people nowadays would probably consider this a kid's game it's not it's a family game it's a game that kids and adults can enjoy together and grandparents three generation game but the scores can vary wildly because you have some uh, positive tiles, which are plus eight. You have negative tiles go all the way down to negative 10. And of course you can get the lucky tiles, which turn a negative into a positive. So by the end, you may have some players with big positive scores and you may have some players with negative scores. I personally think that for a game that plays well with kids, you probably don't want the scores to vary like a huge amount because if you do then, and the kids are on kind of the, the, the bad side of that, disparity then they're going to feel disappointed right but i mean the game is simple enough that when you're playing it's not like the adults have some big advantage all right it's not a memory game the memory games are the ones where the kids have the advantage but still the game is so easy to learn for ages eight and up or you know younger for smarter kids you know definitely younger could play it if they're particularly bright six-year-olds they could definitely play this game they're not really at a disadvantage because they learn immediately. They'll pick up the game just like that. I'm not actually snapping my fingers, but... It's interesting in that That's Life had sort of the base game, which has like a standard setup. And it's interesting that in the new version, they refer to that as the pro mode. But in both versions, you can easily do variants. You can easily mix up the tiles, have quite a varied setup. I do like the original setup or the pro mode 
because it creates this arc. You start off with negative tiles that get worse and worse. Then you're into the lucky tiles, which are the best tiles. Then you enter the positive scoring tiles, which are plus eight down to plus one. And the negative tiles, again, negative one up to, I think, negative 10. And the guards start on the first eight good tiles. So, okay, that first bit, you know, you got some negative tiles. People are trying to avoid taking them, whatever. And then you're trying to get onto the lucky tiles. You may want to keep one pawn back so that as people take the negative tiles, it's easier to go directly to the lucky tiles, right? You just skip over any spaces that the, the tiles have already been taken from. But the lucky tiles have guards on them. And players won't be able to get those really great lucky tiles until they move the guards off. So their dice are rolled, maybe they're leaving the pawn where they are and they're moving the guards instead. They're moving their guards forward. Eventually the guards will be moved off the lucky tiles onto the positive scoring tiles. But on the positive scoring tiles, same thing. Once the pawns get up there, well, we gotta move the guards out of the way so we can get these positive scoring tiles. And then where do the guards go? Forward onto the negative tiles. If you leave a tile with a guard on it, you don't take the tile, which is a good thing for the negative tiles. So what happens is, is that when the pawns are in the good tiles, people are moving the guards forward so that they can, you know, they can be the last ones to leave the tile. They can get the tile, but then the guards are moved on to the negatives. And then it's kind of moving the pawns through the guards' shadow, right? So if you're on a, your pawn is on a negative six tile and there's a guard, you want to get that pawn out of there now so that you don't have to take the tile. But of course, another player can be like, oh, I'm just gonna move that guard off, right? <laughs> forward onto, you know, forward toward the uh, the end. And now you're alone on that tile, which means if you move that pawn, you have to take it. So it creates this really nice arc. And I suppose some might think that maybe it doesn't create a huge amount of variability, but the fact that the board is just a bunch of tiles all put together in a in a snake-like fashion means you can mix it up vary it up as much as you want and the new version is really good that way because i actually really like the give steel tiles so what you probably want to do if you have this version is just put them all together use all of them they're all great use the guards because that adds more decisions if you're a hobbyist family definitely always play with the guards um, only play the normal game without the guards if you're playing with like really little kids or something or you're just trying to like bang a game out like really fast. Generally, you'll always want the guards in there because it makes it more interesting, more choices of things to move. This version, the Ravensburger edition, um, you can't really tell from the video, but it's in a little bit of an odd shaped box. I don't have any other boxes that are this exact same size and shape. And that always just annoys me a little bit. <laughs> uh, the Amigo edition uh, is in a Carcassonne size box, exactly the same size as Carcassonne, pretty standard box. Um, in general, Amigo has done a great job with this. Now, before we talk about the Amigo edition, let's talk about this Ravensburger edition. So it came out 2005, and a couple years after, well, I think it was a, you can, it's fair to say it was a fair success, moderate success. It did have two expansions that came out uh, afterwards. I don't think they ever got really big like distribution in English speaking countries. So the first expansion, I mean, both expansions are like kitchen sink expansions. They just throw like a bunch of stuff like for variability. Um, I know the first expansion allowed you to increase the player count to seven or eight players. So it came with extra pawns. I personally wouldn't prefer to play this with seven or eight, but it's nice that it supports it. And maybe with some of the the random bits in the expansion it makes it a more interesting game for for seven or eight players and the other expansion again has a bunch of random stuff but one of those random things is cards for movement instead of rolling the dice i think you have like a deck of cards and they each have different like movement um you know number numbers for for movement some of them are even negative and i believe you have a hand of two and then you play one to move one of your pawns um, I'd be really curious to try that, actually. That sounds really interesting. None of that stuff made it into this version, the 2020 edition, but I really like this edition. Uh, the artwork is refreshed. It's a little more 
fun and dynamic. It adds those give and steal tiles, which are a lot of fun, especially for kids. Um, but otherwise, it's exactly the same game. It comes with all the bits you need to play regular old school That's Life. I think this 2020 edition is actually really great. And if you are interested at all in this game, uh, you should probably seek out this edition. This is German language only. I'm sure like here in North America, there are stores that will import these. Um, in general, so Amico is kind of a weird company now in that they have like a U.S version of Amigo, which I think is actually run by the, the, the old uh, head of Mayfair, um, Alex Yeager. But they have an interesting kind of attitude where they take some of like the, the big hits or the ones I think have the most mass market appeal and they make really cheap versions of that game for the English language market. It's just kind of going in a different direction than some of the other publishers. Um, there is no English edition of this one as far as I know. This one is German only, but Amigo's really good. Amigo Germany anyway, very good. They have uh, lots of different languages, uh, rule books that you can find on their website. So, you know, go onto Amigo's website, print out the English rules and you're good to go. So if you're interested at all in this game, I mean, this one completely works fine, especially if you can get some expansions for variety. Uh, but otherwise, you should definitely seek out this one as the best one. Do not, I'm warning you, do not get Ghosts on the Moor. Let's talk about Ghosts on the Moor. Have a look, photos on Board Game Geek. Check this game out. It plays very, very similarly to Verflixt. In that there is a track, and the track has tiles. And you're rolling a die and choosing one of your pieces to move. So the rules are actually fairly different in that instead of the path just being the tiles, there is a board. The path is pre-printed on the board. Most of the tiles that you would pick up are good for you because you're trying to collect sets of different tiles. But the spaces have symbols on them. And if you have to leave a space that's empty, that doesn't have a tile on it, you actually have to pay a tile. I think of the matching symbol. Um, I haven't played this very much, so I might be getting a rule or two wrong. I'm not teaching this game, though, so don't worry about a mistake or two, because I'm, it's not worth it, honestly. It's in a lovely little tiny little box, which is great, but the board is small, too. It's very, very small, which is, I guess, fine that they don't go up to six players, because I couldn't imagine six people crowding around this tiny little board. Um, for me, it's just... It's pretty much worse than Verflix in every way. You know, it is an interesting twist that most of the tiles, not all of them, the ghosts are bad, but the rest of the tiles are good and you're trying to collect sets. So it's kind of a little bit of a reversal of that's life, Verflix, and that in Verflix, most of the tiles are bad, right? And uh, this one, most of the tiles are good. And you're, But the fact that you're trying to collect sets, look, it's not a complicated thing. But it's unnecessarily complicated for what is being presented as a kid's game. Honestly, Verflix is a much better kid's game than, than Ghosts of the Moor. Um, so this was a real misfire. Um, you know, if you can pick it up for cheap in a trade or something, give it a try. Uh, maybe with fewer players, too. It's not so bad that the board is really tiny. Everything is tiny in this little box. But, I mean, it's nice that it, it's in a small box, right? And actually, a, a box this small with just tiles, I think sounds completely fine but the fact that it comes with a board and the board is small oof. yeah maybe i'm not describing very well why i don't like this but i would just say take it from me don't bother with ghosts of the moor um you'll want you'll want one of these two <laughs> and preferably this one this is the best of the of, of all of them because you can play this with this but the artwork's a little bit more more fun. It's got uh, the extra give steel tiles. Um, it's a standard size box. I think Miko did a really good job with this. So visually, this is similar to two other games, and it's worthwhile to mention these. One is Tutankhamun, uh, which is a Reiner Knizia game, uh, originally from Amigo, actually, but. There's an out-of-the-box version, the most recently one from 25th Century Games. And there's another game called Bytes, originally known as Big Points. 
they both work similarly in that players have a pawn, or of course in Bear Flick's case, multiple pawns, and you're moving along a track collecting tiles. Those games are a little bit thinkier than Verflixed. And the reason is because there's no dice rolls. In those games, you choose how far forward you want to move. And even though the setup is random, after that initial setup, everything is just your choice. So part of that game is kind of analyzing the board, looking ahead. Of course, other players are going to be doing things maybe you didn't predict, so you got to change your plans. But part of the game is analyzing that board. And this is much, much lighter than those games. So basically, you don't even have to, you don't have to think about anything when it's not your turn, right? Your turn comes, somebody passes you the die, you just roll it. Uh, okay, I'll move this pawn. Okay, next, right? Super, super breezy. But also not thinky at all. I will definitely do Tutankhamun at some point. Uh, maybe not too long from now, actually. Um, I'm still debating whether to do big point slash bites. Um, but if you like thinky games, you may want to look at one of those two instead. But for uh, just a light family affair, like I said, three generations, a game that you can play with your parents and your kids, uh, it's good solid fun. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Verflixed don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.